All right, hello everyone and welcome to online lecture 10, normal distributions and z-scores. So today, um, we're gonna be in the land of populations, okay? So everything's gonna be nice, clean distributions. And we're gonna be working with the normal curve a lot. Um, so I want you to think of the bars under the curve as remember it's a histogram and the height of each bar represents frequency. So when we're talking about the normal curve, we are talking about a lot of variables that take on this kind of interesting property, such as snowflakes, heights, IQs. Okay, so that's the area we're going to be in today. Now, I want to recall a couple of things to move us forward. The first thing I want to recall is standard deviation. Standard deviation is the average amount the values or scores differ from the mean. And we spent some time together actually talking through standard deviation and what that means and, and how you calculate it. And once again, here's our normal curve, right? And it's bell-shaped and it's unimodal and it's symmetrical. So now I want to take the standard deviation and the normal curve and put them together. Okay, so here's a quick reminder about our coin flips. And if you remember, even though coin flips is quite the dichotomous activity, right? You either just get a heads or tails. Somehow, when we did a whole bunch of coin flips and counted the number of heads and looked at the frequencies, we came out with a normal distribution. Okay. So now let's look at our normal curve and let's look at standard deviations together. So what's interesting about the normal curve, and this doesn't necessarily apply to any other type of distribution, and that's what makes the normal curve so special, at least one of the reasons, is that if we look at the distance between the mean and one standard deviation up, you will always capture about 34% of the people. If you look at the mean and go one standard deviation down, you will also capture just about 34% of the people. If you go from one standard deviation to two standard deviations, you capture another 14%, whether you go from plus one SD to plus two SD or minus one standard deviation to minus two standard deviation. Either way, you're capturing 14% of the people. So, so far we captured 68% by going from one SD down to one SD up. And then we add in another 28%, we're getting pretty close to 95% there. And then beyond two standard deviations, in either direction only exists 2% of the people. So that's getting kind of special if you're out beyond two standard deviations up or two standard deviations down. Now, another way to think of this is because the curve is symmetrical, 50% of people lie at the mean or above, 50% of the people lie at the mean or below. Okay. So there's a rule of thumb that you can use to put all this information together, and I'll share that with you in a second. Um, I do want to share with you that these numbers are not precise. They're close enough, I think, for our purposes, but it's more like 34.13, 13.59, 2 I don't want you to really worry about that. I just shared that in case you were curious, like how did these numbers come out to be exact? And they don't, but this, this, I think, is close enough, again, for our purposes. Then we have the 68, 99.7 rule. And it's a guideline for the percentage of data values that lie within one, two, and three standard deviations of the mean for any normal distribution. So like we were talking about before, if there's 34% between the mean and one standard deviation up, and 34% between the mean and one standard deviation down, we cover 68% of people total. 
Notice here that the mean is represented by mu. Remember I told you we'd be in the population world today and mu is our symbol for the population mean. We also are representing our standard deviation by sigma. Sigma is for our population standard deviation. So if we go two standard deviations up and down, we cover about 95% of the people. And if we go three standard deviations up and down, we cover about 99.7% of the people. Okay. Remember, this is all symmetrical on both sides. Okay. So again, lying outside of three standard deviations, either up or down, only 0.3% of the people exist. So most of us lie within, 68% of us lie within one up and one down, 95% lie within two up and two down, and 99.7% of us lie within three up and three down. Okay. So if you're ever looking for a, a something to say to your significant other, you could always tell them you're three standard deviations above the norm. Okay, right? That would put them uh, less than 0.3 in the 0.3% category and really in the 0.15% category. Hopefully of some good quality. Okay. So now that you understand Z scores and now that you understand, uh, sorry, now that you understand standard deviation and how they work with normal curves, we can now talk about z-scores. A z-score is a standardized score. And what that means is we can convert values or raw scores such that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And this allows for direct comparisons for different variables that maybe otherwise you couldn't compare. Now, a z-score is really just the number of standard deviations you are above or below the mean. That's it. So if you're one above the mean, your z-score is one. If you're two below the mean, your z-score is negative two. Okay, so z-score is either positive or negative if you're Above, it's positive. If you're below the mean, it's negative. And the number of z-score is just how much above or how much below you are. Okay. So let's start looking at a formula for a z-score. So Z simply equals the score minus the mean over the population standard deviation. So again, Z, our standardized score, equals the raw score from the population, the mean of the normal distribution, divided by the population standard deviation. And we'll, show, we'll kind of go through and talk about how z-scores can be really useful. But just to give you a quick example, let's say you have two different people who want to compare their test scores for a statistics class. So one person walks out of the class with a 78, and the scores mean was a 50 and the standard deviation was two. Another person walks out of the class with an 84, where the, where the, the test mean was 86 and the standard deviation was 1.5. Okay. Okay. 
So any variable with a known population mean and standard deviation can be transformed into a z-score. So you can take those two test scores I just shared with you and be able to compare them using z-scores. See, otherwise it might be hard to compare that 78 and that 84. But with the power of z-scores, we can do so. Okay. And z-scores will always have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So let's take an example of calculating a z-score. Jacob spoke to other children eight times in an hour. The mean number of times children speak is 12 and the standard deviation is four. So to change a raw score to a z-score, we're gonna take the raw score minus the mean score. So think about how you would do that. What's the raw score? That's Jacob's score. What's the mean score? That's the average score. And then divide by the standard deviation. So we would take eight minus 12 gives us negative four. Negative four divided by our standard deviation of four gives us negative one. So what percent of children speak more than Jacob? Well, we know our z-score is negative one. So let's look at the normal curve again. What percent of children speak more than Jacob? So where's Jacob? Jacob is by negative one. We're trying to find all the people that speak more than Jacob. So what are we doing? We're going from the negative one SD line all the way up. So there's two ways to approach this. You could take 34 from negative one SD to the mean, plus 34 from the mean to one SD, plus 14 from plus one SD to plus two SD, plus two from plus two SD beyond. You could add all those up. Or you could recognize that everything beyond the mean is 50. And then I just have to take that 50 and add it to the 34 that's between negative one SD and the mean. And then I would get the answer of 84%. 84% 84 of children speak more than Jacob. Okay. So you'll get a chance to try more of these. In fact, here's one right now. There are two well-known introversion measures. Introversion test A has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. Introversion test B has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of eight. Jill takes test A and scores 115. Jack takes test B and scores 66. Who is more introverted compared to their peers? Okay. So let's do this as a your turn kind of activity. Um, take a moment, think it through, pause the video, and see if you come up with the answer. So let's talk about it now that you've come back. Okay. So how did we get that Jill's z-score is 1.5 and Jack's z-score is two? Well, we took 115, Jill's test score, subtracted 100, wound up with 15, divided by 10, and we got 1.5. Jack, on the other hand, had 66 minus 50, 16 divided by eight, the standard deviation, which is two. So Jack's z-score is higher than Jill's z-score. 
And so Jack is more introverted compared to his peers as compared to Jill. Okay. Let's try this example. Now this data is entirely made up just for the sake of talking through these issues in this class. So the z-score this time is going to be around hours spent on the web. So in the male population, we're going to say that the mean number of hours is six and the standard deviation is two. In the female population, we're going to say that the mean score is four, standard deviation is one. John has a five hours spent on the web and Katie spends 4.5 hours on the web. So once again, I invite you to take a moment, calculate the answer, pause the video, and then I'll continue on. Okay, so let's look at John's z-score and Katie's z-score, and here's how you get them. John score five minus the mean score six divided by two, the standard deviation, gives us negative a half or negative 0.5. Katie's z-score is 4.5 minus four or 0.5 divided by standard deviation of one which is 0.5 divided by one, which is 0.5. So clearly Katie uses the web more compared to the population as compared to John compared to his population. Okay. Compared to their peers, Katie spent more time on the web than did John. All right. Now I want to look at this a little bit differently. Introversion test A has a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 10. What z-score would correspond to being in the top 5% of introverted persons on introversion test A? Now we can approximate using our normal curve, right? We could go back to our normal curve. Excuse me, I'm going to go back to our normal curve. And we could approximate using this. We could say, okay, so 2% is by plus 2 SD, 16% adding one and two together is around one SD. So if I want the top 5%, I'm somewhere between one and two, and I'm closer to two, you know, maybe I'm around 175, I don't know. I'm somewhere around this mark between one and two. Okay, let's go back to our current example. But in order to be exact, in order to get the exact finding of what the top 5% of introverted persons on introversion test day, what that z-score would be, we need what's called a table. We need specifically a z-table. Now you're gonna get introduced to some different tables in this course, and this is the very first one, the z-table. So here is part of the z-table, okay? And I'm going to walk it through with you so you understand how it works. Okay. So we have basically three columns. I know it looks like six columns, but what's happening is that the three columns are just repeating over here. So when people have created these tables in the past, they were all about saving space. And that's because everything was, was printed on paper and included in books and, you know, that, that was the goal. So there's still this carryover of this notion of trying to save space. So basically, the first three columns go all the way down and then move over to the next three columns. Okay, so we're only ever working with three columns. So what are our three columns? Z, percent mean to Z, and percent and tail. Now of those three columns, we're pretty much always going to use two. Now I'm going to briefly explain all three to you, but we are going to focus on the Z and the percent and tail. Okay. Now, if you look at the diagrams above the columns, that's actually really helpful. So if we look at the percent mean to Z, it will tell you 
what if you tell them what the percent from mean to z you want you can look and see what the z score is or over here in percent and tail this is telling us if given a certain z score what's the percent left in the tail or given a certain percent in tail what's the corresponding z score so what we would want to do is scroll all the way through our percent and tails, and this is not a complete table, the complete table is four pages long. And you have that now in your G2L under content, under tables. And if you scroll all the way down percent and tail, you will eventually come to two numbers that are very close to five, because we're looking for 5% in our tail. The first of these is 5.05. .05. The second of these is 4.95. And you will notice one of these corresponds to 1.64 and one of these corresponds to 1.65. Now, by convention, we use 1.64 to correspond to 5% in the tail. We use 1.64 to correspond to 5% in the tail. Okay. So working this through, when we want to find the exact z-score using the normal curve table, we want the top 5% so we can use the percent and tail column of the normal curve table. The closest percentages to 5% are 4.95% and 5.05%, which correspond to a z-score of 1.65 and 1.64. Okay, so now that we know how to do this, excuse me, now that we know how to do this, you can look at your z-score table and figure out what z-score corresponds to being in the top 20% and what z-score corresponds to being in the bottom 20%. Now you might think that this is a little tricky because how do I distinguish between the top 20% and the bottom 20%? In fact, as you look at the table even further, you might notice there's only positive z-scores. Well, how is that the case? Because we already know that half the z-scores are negative. All the ones on the left side of the normal curve are negative. Well, I already shared with you that when they've created these tables historically, they were trying to save space. And we already know that the normal curve is symmetrical, right? So what they did is they decided to only include half the table, only the positive z-scores, thinking that you could easily figure out the negative z-scores because they're really the same. So in other words, the number that corresponds to the top 20% is the positive z-score, and the number that corresponds to the bottom 20% is the negative z-score. So whenever we're looking for something above the 50 percentile line, we're going to be positive, and whenever we look for something below the 50 percentile line, we're going to be negative. So having said that, Let's see if we can come up with the answer for being in the top and bottom 20%. Okay, so here we are with the top 20 and top and bottom 20%. We already have an idea of what we're looking for. I'm gonna switch my share over to the actual Z table so we can look at this together. Okay, so here's how the Z table actually looks if you pull up um, the version on your D2L. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna look for percent in tail to be 20. So I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Aha! 
here is something that's really close. I have 20.05. And you can see the next one down is 19.77. Well, 20.05 is a lot closer to 20 than 19.77. And I should warn you that it's not always going to be precise and exact. You're typically looking for the closest number. And you're typically not going to run into that problem that we had with the 1.64 and 1.65 in our last example. Um, I, I pointed that one out specifically because it's an important number, the top 5%, and because it is a little confusing. So, for this one, it's pretty straightforward. We want the 20.05. We swing over to the left for the corresponding z-score. And we see it's 0.84. So if you're in the top 20%, your z-score is positive 0.84. If you're in the bottom 20%, your z-score is negative 0.84. So positive 0.84, negative 0.84. All right. Now let's go back to our earlier example where we were talking about the top 5% being a z-score of 1.64. Now let's look at something else. So far, we looked at how to go from a raw score to a z-score, how to go from z-score to percent and from percent to z-score. Well, the only thing we haven't looked at is how to go from a z-score back to a raw score. So that's what we're gonna look at now. What would the raw score or value be for someone with that z-score who took introversion test A with a mu mean of 100 and a sigma standard deviation of 10. So here's the formula for going backwards. Remember, whatever's to the left of your equal sign, again, to the left of your equal sign, is what you're trying to figure out. That's what you're trying to get. So in this case, what am I trying to figure out? What am I trying to get? My raw score. So what's my raw score? It's the z-score times the standard deviation plus the mean. So I'll give you a second to try to figure out what the raw score would be. And then let's figure it out together. It's 1.64 times 10 for the standard deviation plus 100 for the mean. So that's 16.4 plus 100, which is 116.4. Okay. Let's try that one more time. Suppose that the mu equals 15 and the sigma equals 1.5. What would the raw score or value be for someone with a z-score of three? So here's our formula once again. Take a moment to figure it out. Okay. So it's three, our z-score, times 1.5, our standard deviation, plus 15, our mean. So it's 4.5 plus 15, or 19.5. Okay. That's all I have to share with you today regarding normal distributions and z scores. Um, hopefully, that's clear. Hopefully, you got some practice with those examples. As always, if you would like more practice or want to talk to me about it further, um, come to the class session for this or go ahead and sign up for a office hour time and I'm happy to work this through with you. Otherwise, be well, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.